it is a travesty and a flagrant violation of the Constitution. Legal experts are reacting to the news that hundreds of cases just in Multnomah County are being dismissed because of the shortage of public defenders in Oregon. K2's Eric Mock joins us live from outside the Multnomah County Courthouse. Eric, the district attorney released the case numbers for almost 300 dismissed cases. Yeah, and he says he's going to keep releasing the number of cases dismissed out of court because of the lack of public defenders each week to draw more attention to this severe public defender shortage, a shortage that experts say is hurting everyone involved in the criminal justice system. DA Mike Schmidt says there have been more than 280 cases dismissed in Multnomah County in 2022. According to case numbers provided by the DA, 75 of those cases were misdemeanors, while at least 206 were felonies, all because there wasn't a public defender available. People are not getting the help they need, and the system is going adrift. That's senior attorney for the Oregon Justice Resource Center, Ben Hale. He's representing four defendants who are suing the state of Oregon for not providing them a defense attorney. But he says this crisis is impacting many more than just these four. Over 90% of people charged with crimes in Oregon rely on a public defender. For people of color, that rate is even higher. And it's not just impacting criminal defendants. A lot of um, crime victims are waiting for some progress on the case too. They keep getting notices that they may be called in as a witness, and yet they, um, they're they just left on hold by this. We reached out to DA Schmidt about the dismissed cases, but we were told he's unavailable. In a statement though, he said in part, quote, this sends a message to crime victims in our community that justice is unavailable and their harm will go unaddressed. Hale also says it's not just a matter of paying public defenders more. A recent study by the American Bar Association that said that we would need to triple the number of public defenders to provide adequate representation. Hale hopes their lawsuit will spur some of the change that's needed. The solutions are too slow in coming. This crisis just tarnishes our entire system of justice. We're also hoping to see lawmakers take this crisis with utmost seriousness. And at least one Oregon lawmaker seems to be. Last week, Oregon's first congressional district representative, Suzanne Bonamici, introduced the Ensuring Quality Access to Legal Defense Act, or Equal Defense Act, which she says would help provide more resources for overburdened public defenders. And that legislation would do several things if passed, including create a $250 million grant program to help fund public defense, to help you know kind of ease the workload for full-time public defenders. It would establish pay equity between public defenders and prosecutors within the next five years, and provide $5 million for nonprofit and government organizations to train public defenders and give them comprehensive training. We're going to have a full breakdown of that bill on our website, ketu.com. And just to know, we also reached out to Metropolitan Public Defender to ask about these dismissed cases. They're the largest provider of uh, public defender services in the state of Oregon, but we didn't hear back from them. It's horrible. It is unbelievably bad. When David Obele describes his five months living on the streets of Portland, it sounds like hell. But that's not why he reached out to K2 News. He says that story about how people are suffering without services has been told a million different ways. Blood pressure. He wants you to see what's happening in his 445 square foot apartment when a homeless to housing success story starts to unravel. Uh, I'm now on blood pressure medication, which wasn't one of my issues before. Um, I have spent some time in the hospital because of the stress involved. Uh, is causing other problems. I also have stage three Parkinson's and we're now looking at stage four at this point because I'm going downhill fast. Obele was placed in this apartment in July by Transition Projects Inc or TPI. The nonprofit uses funding that's funneled through the Joint Office of Homeless Services to help people pay for rentals throughout the metro area. Obele says his original agreement said 100% of the first year of his rent would be covered. He planned to save his Social Security income for future rent that's only partially subsidized. But in August, he got a surprise notice taped to his door. Rent was overdue, $614 for July, 801 for August. Two days later, he says he got another notice. The bottom part of it says that if I did not cure it by... September 10th, 
that I would receive a three-day notice and they could begin eviction proceedings at that time. What was your reaction when you saw that? <laughs> I had a stroke. I couldn't believe it. Obelay says he panicked and contacted TPI. He got an email back reassuring him, saying in part, I just have over 30 people on my caseload right now, and I'm sort of a chicken with its head cut off. He was told the property management was getting a check from TPI, and he could relax. Everything's okay. It's all fixed. We paid everything. Don't worry, you're not going to be evicted. But Obele says they were just getting started. Numbers started coming at him through dozens of emails, texts, and in-person visits to sign new paperwork. He would owe 465 a month, 516 a month. Then it went up to 600. I fought back with that one. Wait a minute. You have now priced me out of my ball game. Utilities were covered but hadn't been paid, or maybe they had been. Obelay says his head was spinning, so he started blasting emails off to everyone. TPI, the county, the city, even state leaders. And how many hours do you think you have spent oh, looking things up, emailing, calling? Figure 40 hours a week for five weeks at this point. He says he's still not sure if 465 is the right number. We asked TPI for an interview. Maybe we could help clear up the confusion. The president and CEO sent us an email back saying, thank you for meeting with David. Prior to this date and in response to his complaint, I responded to his questions and provided clarity about his housing agreement. In addition, he's connected to his TPI case for needed support. Unfortunately, to assure privacy, I cannot provide additional details, but want to be responsive to your inquiry. We also reached out to the Joint Office of Homeless Services. They told us they weren't sure if the apartment was funded by the supportive housing services tax. They also said that one example of a dispute over services, no matter how it's resolved, can't be an authoritative stand in the rest of a system that's moved 4,560 people into housing last year, with a quarter of those folks, 1,129, funded with SHS. We followed up with proof from Obelay that his apartment is funded by that SHS tax that voters approved in 2020. We asked for an interview, but did not get a response. I will fight mine tooth and nail, and I'm going to get through this one way or another, and I'm going to end up okay. Obele is now trying to renegotiate medical bills to give himself a little more wiggle room for his rent. He says he's frustrated and angry, not just for himself, but for anyone else who might feel abandoned by the system that's supposed to help them. My question at this point is, how many other people have gone through or are going through what I am going through, not had the wherewithal to fight it? like they were set up to fail. Some public colleges and universities in Oregon are seeing more empty chairs in classrooms as enrollment numbers drop. And some say this is an ongoing trend only made worse by the pandemic. More than half of our students, about 60% of our students enroll at PSU as transfer students. And uh, most come from one of the other community colleges, one of the community colleges in Oregon. And they were hit, community colleges were hit really hard during the pandemic. Chuck Neffley, the vice president of enrollment management at Portland State, says PSU's enrollment dropped this year. And they're not alone. Overall enrollment at Oregon public colleges and universities has fallen during the pandemic. But if you go into public institutions, um, the big name brand, well-known institutions seem to be doing better than um, more regional campuses and certainly better than community colleges. According to the state's Higher Education Coordinating Commission, Portland Community College's enrollment fell by 7 percent. That equals about 1,700 students. Portland State has dipped by 8 percent, or 1,900 students. But while overall enrollment has declined, not every school has faced enrollment cuts. John Bockenstead, the vice provost of enrollment management at Oregon State, says this was a record year. It's the really astonishing thing is that our enrollment has continued to grow even during the pandemic. 
and even despite a pretty dramatic fall off in international students. Oregon State had a 6% uptick in enrollment, which equals about 2,200 students. The University of Oregon also went up by 6%, gaining 1,400 students. OSU says its robust online program through eCampus grew substantially during the pandemic, bringing in more students. PSU says while it sees a future in developing more online programs, it values the in-person learning at the downtown campus.